that other guy. We have a president that can get things done. Am I right? Now, I know everyone's heard about the projects that are being built all over the country because of the massive infrastructure bill we passed, including the project being built right here. Below our feet, workers are digging the tunnel for the purple line that will make it possible for veterans all over Los Angeles to be a train ride away from reaching vital services like health care, mental health counseling, and housing. Now, I want to talk about an important provision of that bill that I worked on that ensures that jobs building these projects popping up in Mid Wilshire, in Leimert Park, South Central, and all over the city, that the people getting these jobs are the people that actually live in the communities. <laughs> the local hire provision that we passed and that the president signed into law allows local transportation agencies like LA Metro to prioritize the hiring of local Angelinos for projects that are taking place in their own backyard. My district had recently had two major transit construction projects running straight through it. In South LA, it's the Crenshaw Line, which opened just last week and is going to bring vital means of public transportation to neighborhoods historically neglected when it comes to economic investment. On the west side, it's the Purple Line, where we are today, which is going to help hundreds of veterans every month get the services they need, especially in a time when people are looking for work and when our economy is in need of a push. It makes no sense that people living in our communities couldn't be prioritized for these jobs. And we know what a good paying job can mean, especially in Los Angeles, when we have so many people sleeping on our streets. Every night, a good paying job can mean preventing your family from falling into homelessness. That's why this infrastructure bill is so important, and that's why it is an incredible honor to be here with the President of the United States. Thank you all so much. Hi. <laughs> I'm a little nervous, but. <laughs> Hello, my name is Irvina Hernandez, and I am a labor apprentice with the Local 300, working on the Metro Purple Line Extension Section 3 project here in LA, my hometown. I didn't start off in the construction industry. I was actually a physical therapist when my sister-in-law asked if I wanted to go to a training program for the union. I didn't really know what it meant to be a, in the union, but I said, sure, I'm always open to trying something different, and this is very different. E eventually, I graduated from boot camp and joined the union. The union has changed my life for, better, for the better. I can make a good living and retire comfortably, and I am a level six apprentice. I, I love what I do because there is so much room to grow. Every day I learn something new, and my union coordinator are there to support me and help me get extra training. This is more than a job, this is a career. And it allows me to provide for the, my three beautiful children and family. I also get to be a part of an incredible project like this right in my backyard. I'll always be able to point to this and say, I helped build that. Whenever I can, I tell women interested in working in construction that they should never be afraid to try something new. That's always been my attitude. And this is definitely something new. And now I have the incredible honor today to welcome and introduce the President of the United States. <laughs> Before she walks off the stage, I want her to understand why, for certain, she has this job. First of all, I know I get criticized by the other team be being the most pro-union president in history. There's a simple reason for that. People don't understand how many year, how many months and years of apprenticeship? Four. Four. Four years. 
So they think anybody just shows up for a union job and gets a job. It's like going back to school. It is going to school. And they're the best in the world. They're the best in the world, all of you. I'm not just saying that. You, the middle class built this country, and unions built the middle class, and you're on this job because that woman said, hire local. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. Well, Mr. Mayor and soon to be Miss Mayor, <laughs> I, uh, Mayor Garth said he's been a good friend for a long, long time. To be really honest about it, I probably wouldn't be standing here addressing you had he not, uh, helped me a lot. And, uh, and thank you for welcoming me to your city. I want to thank, uh, Hilda Solis. I resent the fact she left Washington because I miss her personally, but her, she love of her job and what she's doing for Los Angeles is so consequential. A special thank you to California Democrats in Congress, many of whom are here today. Senator Padilla, I, uh, you are you, you, you're the same way. You jumped in to help me out. You're doing one hell of a job as a freshman senator. I mean, I mean that sincerely. And it's noticed by everyone. It's great to see you. Representative Maxine Waters. Whatever Maxine says, I agree with. <laughs> Natalie Bragon. Natalie, where, where, where's Nat? Where, no, Nanette. Where's Nanette? There you are. Sorry, Nanette. I didn't see you back there. And Ted Liu and, uh, and, and Ned Barragon, there, Ted, there you are. And uh, Linda Sanchez and Brad Sherman. And uh, I just don't want to leave anybody out. And uh, uh, what's her name again? Karen uh, Bass? Karen, you're the best. You're the best. Look, folks, um, you know, uh, one of the things about a real leader is the place they're trying to lead matters a lot of how much they love the place they live. She loves this city, and she's always working with the people of her district. And I know this is — you and Ted are about a block, you know, separated by a street, but you're always working to expand opportunity and a better future for all our children and our families, for this city and all around the country. And, uh, and you never leave anybody behind. The way you vote, you never leave anybody behind. And that's exactly what this project will do that you all are building. It's going to be a better life for everybody, and I'm not, that's not hyperbole. Before I begin, let me say a few words quickly about today's report on inflation. Americans are squeezed by the cost of living. It's been true for years, and folks don't need to be a report to tell them they're being squeezed. Fighting this battle every day is the key reason why I ran for President of the United States. The way I think about it is the way my dad used to talk about it. And he'd say, you know, after the end of the month, when you get your paycheck, at the end of the month, you have enough to pay for everything you owe, all your bills, and would you have a little left for some breathing room, just a little bit of breathing room. And that's my view of what is important and critical. And a lot of people are hurting these days. And today's report shows, though, some progress. Overall, inflation was 2 percent over the last three months. That's down from 11 percent over the prior three months. And that's progress, but a lot of it is a result of getting the cost of living at the gas pump down by more, not even California now, by more than a dollar nationally and since the start of this summer. And there's a big difference for working folks. But the price of gas is still too high, and we need to keep working to bring it down. And I'll have more to say about that next week. We also need to make more progress bringing down the prices across the board. That's why I just couldn't disagree more with my Republican friends who say the biggest problem on our economy right now is that working folks are making too much money. No, that's the argument. Workers are making too much money, and too many people are working. Too many jobs are being filled. I think that's a bunch, as we already said, a bunch of malarkey. The biggest problem, the biggest problem is the world's challenge, global inflation and the pandemic and Putin's unconscionable invasion of Ukraine. Here's the deal. Because of my economic plan, we are better positioned than any other major economy in the world to weather the challenges that come through this as a stronger country. We've created nearly 700,000 manufacturing jobs just in the last 19 months. Businesses are investing here in America at record rates. 
They see what I see, the resilience of the American people and the potential of building an economy from the bottom up and the middle out. Look, when the middle does well and the bottom has a chance, the wealthy do very well. They never get hurt. I'm so tired of trickle down, I'm finished with it. So we're going to keep at it by taking on big pharma and the insurance companies, especially the health insurance companies. With the help of Democrats in Congress here today, I signed the Inflation Reduction Act, which gave Medicare the power that we've been trying to get for the last 30 years, the power to negotiate lower prescription drug prices. We pay the highest drug prices of any nation in the world. For seniors on Medicare, we're capping the cost of prescription drugs at $2,000 a year, even if they're doing, using the most expensive cancer drug in the world. We're capping the cost of insulin, which is 30, 40 times higher than the number I'm going to give you, at $35. $35 a month. You can't go higher than that. Folks, we're locking in savings and health care premiums for millions of people in the Affordable Care Act. And today, I'm announcing the Social Security benefits are going to go up by an average of $140 a month, even as Medicare premiums go down. So, folks, seniors are going to get have inflation next year. For the first time in 10 years, their Social Security checks will go up while their Medicare premiums go down. Here's my final point. We've got an election in the month. Voters have to decide. Democrats are working to bring down the cost of things and to talk about around the kitchen table, from prescription drugs to health insurance to energy bills and so much more. We're standing up for working people and the right to get a raise and get a better job. Republicans are campaigning every day on an agenda to raise your costs. You know, I should point out before I go on a little, the Republican platform so far for this off your election, led by a senator from Senator Scott from down in Florida, as well as the Senator Johnson from up in Wisconsin. And you know what they argue? This is, this is on paper that, in fact, we should be in a situation where Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid should have to be voted on every single year, every year. The guy from Florida says every five, but the guy from Wisconsin says no, every year, including veterans' benefits. So the idea is you either vote for them or they go out of existence, or you cut them. But you got to affirmatively vote every year. You've been paying into a Social Security account from the time you were 16 years old in your first summer job. It's not fair. And the biggest thing they say they want to do, they want to get rid of get rid of the number one priority, and, the, and they've spoken to it. They want to repeal the Inflation Reduction Act. That means they're going to repeal the $2,000 cap on prescription drugs, gone. Cap on insulin, gone, at 35 bucks. Savings on health care premiums, average of $400 a person, gone. Savings on your utility bills, gone. Corporate minimum tax of 15 percent. By the way, they got very upset with me. Get very upset with me. You know what I did? Well, there were 55 American corporations made $40 billion in 2020. Did not pay a single penny, not a penny, in federal tax. So I was so harsh. I suggested they pay 15 percent, less than you pay. 15 percent. You pay for all this, and it's paying for it. But guess what? My Republican colleagues think that's unfair. They want to repeal that tax. Folks, you know, Republicans are going to make you, working middle class folks, pay higher taxes than the biggest corporations. And by the way, in every single piece of legislation I've gotten passed with help of the people here, we have not raised the tax on anybody making less than 400,000 bucks a year, one penny. I wish I was making 400, you were making 400 grand, but not a single penny. No, I mean it, not a single penny. Republican wins, inflation is going to get worse. It's that simple. Now to today's event. For too long, we've talked about building the best economy in the world. <clears throat> we've talked about asserting America's leadership with the best and safest roads, railroads, ports, airports, etc. Now we're finally getting it done. We're finally deciding that instead of being ranked, catch this, the last eight years or so, America, infrastructure, your bridges, the rail, everything. You know where we're rated in the world, the most powerful nation in the world? Number 13. 
13 in the world, the United States of America. Where do business come to invest? Where they can get their products out of the port, when they get their products out of the yard, where they, can, they can have access to bridges, roads, highways. Look, we should be ranked number one. Instead of infrastructure week being a punchline under my predecessor, infrastructure decade is a headline on my watch for the next 10 years. And last year, with the leadership of your members here in Congress, the ones who are here today, I signed a law once in a generation investments on our nation's roads, highways, bridges, railroads, ports, airports. The law is going to deliver clean air, safer water systems, eliminating lead pipes, electric grid to deliver clean energy, high speed internet, electric charging stations all across America, the power to fleet to, to, to take care of the fleets of new electric vehicles. It's called the bipartisan infrastructure law. And by the way, we got, a, we got a, some Republicans vote for it. About a third of them voted for it and got it passed, and I thank them for that. And it's the most significant investment America has made in our infrastructure, literally, not figuratively, since the interstate highway system built by Dwight D. Eisenhower. And folks, it includes the largest investment in public transit in the history of America. There's no better example of what's happening than right here in Los Angeles. Nearly 10 million people live in L.A. County. I have to tell you that. More than any county in the United States. And every year, people take more than 22 million rides on your subways, your light rail, and your buses. It's how so many folks get to work, school, and how tourists and locals explore this world-class city. But the transit system needs an upgrade badly. You know that. You need to connect more neighborhoods, ease traffic congestion, air pollution, make it easier for people to get around and where they need to go. That's exactly what you're doing. That's exactly what you're doing. But it's being funded in part through this infrastructure law, through local taxes and infrastructure law. This project, the extension of the Metro's Purple Line, it's going to cover one of LA's busiest areas and job centers, from UCLA, the future home of to many sites of the 2028 Olympics, to the By the way, congratulations. I did not use any undue influence. I just said I like L.A. Anyway. <laughs> You're getting in trouble. The first Metro rail line opened in 1990 with 70, 17 stations. Since then, more lines have been built to meet the needs of this vast city. Under Mayor Garcetti's leadership, you finally got going on extending the Purple Line. You got a big boost in funding from the infrastructure law to finish the job. The extension of the Purple Line is going to add seven new stations, build a reliable high-speed connection between downtown and the west side. A trip from Koreatown to the VA campus, which now takes over an hour on a bus, sometimes longer than that, is going to shrink to 25 minutes on rail. We expect to see nearly 80,000 more riders on Metro every day, thanks to the Purple Line extension. Roughly 27,000 fewer car rides every day. It's going to affect pollution in a significant positive way. 124,000 fewer tons of carbon dioxide pumped into the air above, above Los Angeles every year. 124,000. That's what it takes out of the air. Nearly 14 million gallons of gasoline saved. And it's easier to commute for half a million people who come to work every day in, center, in, in Century City or elsewhere on the west side. Plus, this project is a job creator. More than 100,000 workers, union workers, more than 100,000 workers hard at work on the entire Purple Line extension, all three sections. And here's something else. Typically, companies that bid for projects like this one aren't required to hire locals. I mentioned this before, but it's important to mention. When Karen pushed for provision in the infrastructure bill, I didn't even thought about it, to be honest with you, to give agencies like the L.A. Metro, and thank you, by the way, for what you're doing, man, the L.A. Metro, the power to require contractors to hire local and make sure the projects that transform communities like yours are also create jobs for local people from the communities. Local workers can be the first in line for these jobs, thanks to Karen. I really mean it, Karen. Thank you very much. Look, 
This is just one project, one project the infrastructure law is making possible in California. For example, we're moving forward to the East, uh, East, East San Bernardino, Bernardino Valley Light Rail Project, a project that is close to Senator Padilla's uh, uh, heart, uh, and uh, he has not let me forget about it ever. Um, and I haven't, haven't, haven't. And we're going to bring fast and convenient public transportation options to one of the busiest travel cars in America. We're going to help electrify LA's entire bus fleet by 2030. Entire bus electrify. That means every single bus in LA across nearly 200 bus lines will be electric, which will significantly reduce pollution, especially for folks getting on and off diesel buses who have asthma. Folks, diesel exhaust can really affect people's health. That's why we've been helping school districts all across the country, I might add, electrify their school buses to keep kids and avoid childhood asthma. Los Angeles set a goal of zero emissions for the bus fleets by the end of this decade. We're going to help make sure you get that done. And there's more. America invented modern aviation. We've allowed our airports so to lag behind our competitors. Not anyone. Not anyone. We're investing in LAX, including renovations to the central terminal to make it easier to park, to pick up and drop off, to make it to your gate quickly as possible. And I hope eventually to get light rail there, too. Then that's what we're doing with our ports. Earlier this year, I visited the Port of Los Angeles to dealing with the whole issue of on-time access to products that we need to make products here in America. We've done a lot of work there to ease backups and delays, bringing together port operators, shipping companies, labor, to move more goods more rapidly. Last Christmas, we were against the, everyone's ex expectation. We managed to get nearly 97 percent of all gifts delivered on time because of those changes, despite the delays caused by the pandemic. And now we're going further. We're building a new four-lane road to the port of L.A. to make it easier for trucks to drive up to the container terminal, load up their goods for transport, and the port of Long Beach, one of the busiest container ports in the nation. We're going to deepen the channel so ships can move in and out of that harbor faster. And folks, this is going to make our supply chains more efficient, make trade quicker and easier, and reduce air pollution. Then, then we're going to rebuild bridges and highways all across this state, like we're doing across the country. We're working every single day to make sure California has access to high-speed, affordable internet. Aren't you? I, I don't ever want to see again where a family has to park in front of a McDonald's to do online schooling because they don't have access. Already, nearly two million homes across California are getting low-cost or free internet because of the infrastructure law. And we're going to provide clean water across California, replacing lead pipes, worn-out service lines, replenishing Big Bear and other critical water sources, and expanding water recycling as we deal with this historic drought. And it's real. There are just a few of the examples of a more than 350 projects across California with more to come. And when you see these projects in your neighborhood, cranes going up, shovels in the ground, lives being changed, I want you to feel the way I do. Pride. Pride in what we can do when we do it together. This is what I mean when I say we're building a better America. For most of the last century, we led the world by a significant margin because we invested in our people, we invested in ourselves. We used to invest 2 percent of our entire gross domestic product in research and development. It's down to 0.7 percent. This is the United States of America. But along the way, we stopped. Not everyone, though. But I have to say one thing. Even Republicans can get behind this law, although some of them have a funny way of showing it. <laughs> Last week, I saw, you saw it, too, an interesting uh, uh, report on CNN. You all may have seen it. I don't know if CNN is here, but they put out a report. The headline was, quote, Republicans call Biden's infrastructure program socialism. And then they asked for more money, end of quote. <laughs> At my church, they bless me, Father, for I have seen that. <laughs> but look, the report describes Republicans in detail, I'm not going to mention their names, who voted against the infrastructure bill, called me and it socialist, and then attacked it, or all Democrats were passing it. Socialism, radical spending, rushed and irresponsible. Well, now they're quietly and privately 
sending letters to my administration asking for money. We're talking about how important projects are in their districts and for all Americans. Well, guess what? I'm going to give them the money because it's not about them, it's about the people I represent. And Speaker Pelosi says they vote no and then they take the dough. Can't make this stuff up. I got to say, I'm surprised to see there are so many socialists in the Republican caucus. Well, even if they voted against it, I said, I promised during my campaign I'd be president for all of America, every American. Whether you voted for me or not, I'm not leaving anyone behind. And we're building a better America together for everyone, even the districts and congressmen who voted against it. Let me close with this. It's been a rough four or five years for the country, for a lot, for a lot of your families. Things are still pretty tough, even though you got good paying jobs and health insurance. It's still pretty tough. But there's a, there are bright spots where America is reasserting itself, like here, where the best workers in the world are hard at work building a better future for all of us. We're providing our best days to be available to us. And they're ahead of us. They're not behind us. We just have to keep it going. And I know we can. I mean it sincerely. I know we can. I've never been more optimistic about America's future, particularly relative to the rest of the world. We're better positioned than any nation in the world. And every other nation that I'm aware of is aware of it. When I meet with the heads of state in Europe and Asia, they know it. We just have to remember who we are. We are the United States of America. And there's nothing, nothing beyond our capacity, nothing, when we decide we're going to do it together. God bless you all, and may God protect our troops. Thank you. Thanks.